Now that we've discussed nephron physiology, it's a good time to look at the renal tubular defects. Now the eponyms can be hard to remember, but I like the following mnemonic because it helps you to remember the order of the syndromes along the nephron. It goes, the kidneys put out a fabulous glittering liquid. The F in fabulous is for Fanconi syndrome, which is a reabsorption defect in the proximal tubule. In Fanconi syndrome, the cells of the proximal tubule dysfunction, which causes all transporters to be affected rather than an isolated transporter defect. This causes increased excretion of nearly all amino acids, glucose, bicarbonate, and phosphate. Causes include hereditary defects like cystinosis and other causes such as ischemia and toxins or drugs like expired tetracyclines. Barter syndrome is a reabsorption defect in the thick ascending loop of Henle. It's an autosomal recessive mutation of the NAK2CL cotransporter, and it results in hypokalemia and metabolic alkalosis, similar to what you would see with which diuretic? A loop diuretic. Gittleman syndrome is a reabsorption defect in the distal tubule due to an autosomal recessive mutation in the sodium chloride cotransporter. And it's less severe than Barter syndrome. Why is that? Because the majority of reabsorption occurs in the earlier parts of the nephron. And finally, Little syndrome results in increased reabsorption, increased sodium reabsorption, in the distal and collecting tubules. And this is due to increased activity of the epithelial sodium channel. Sodium channel. Sometimes referred to as ENAC. It's an autosomal dominant disease and it results in hypertension. And it also causes decreased aldosterone levels due to negative feedback inhibition from the hypertension. Treatment for Little syndrome is amyloride, which blocks the overactive sodium channel. The step one probably won't be interested in having you memorize the exact genetics of these disorders, but it will be interested in testing you on the signs and symptoms of patients with these conditions, such as hypokalemia in Barter syndrome or hypertension in Little syndrome. Now let's move on to see how solute concentration changes along the proximal tubule. On this graph, the x-axis is the percent distance along the proximal tubule and the y-axis is the ratio of tubular fluid concentration to plasma concentration. If we look at the concentration of inulin along the proximal tubule, it'll make a straight line from 1.0 to 3.0 as we go along the proximal tubule. And this is because it's freely filtered and it's neither secreted or reabsorbed. So the concentration is increasing along the proximal tubule because water is being reabsorbed. And the area below inulin on this graph is going to include all substances that have net reabsorption. And the area above inulin is going to include all substances that have net secretion. Secretion. Now there are a couple of important points to take away here. First, the vast majority of substances have net reabsorption in the proximal tubule. This includes things like urea, 
ions like chloride, potassium, phosphate, and bicarbonate. Bicarbonate, as well as molecules like amino acids and glucose. Second, the second important point to take away is that the tubular fluid to plasma ratio can tell you how quickly something is absorbed relative to water. For example, glucose and amino acids are reabsorbed very quickly in the proximal tubule and much faster than water. So they are completely reabsorbed by the end of the proximal tubule. On the other hand, chloride is reabsorbed slower than water in the proximal tubule, which makes sense since there are other anions such as phosphate and bicarbonate that are being reabsorbed. One important note to, of this graph is sodium, which is reabsorbed at roughly the same rate as water. So the TF to P ratio remains at 1 because remember that water is being reabsorbed isoosmotically so the sodium ratio sodium TF to P ratio is going to stay at 1 remember where sodium goes water follows now molecules that are secreted include things like creatinine and PAH, which we use to measure effective renal plasma flow. So we know they're secreted because their TF to P ratio is above inulin. Now the concepts behind this graph are high yield on the exam, and if you understand how the proximal tubule works, you shouldn't have any trouble filling things in here. For example, why does the line for inulin steadily increase over the course of the proximal tubule? Remember that since inulin is freely filtered but not reabsorbed, the amount of inulin in the tubule remains constant. But water is progressively reabsorbed with sodium, so the concentration of inulin gradually increases from beginning to the end of the proximal tubule. Again, use this graph as a reference during your studies. Now let's discuss how the kidneys regulate blood pressure. This is one of the most important roles of the kidney and it's done using the renin angiotensin aldosterone system also known as RAS. Note the order of the hormones renin angiotensin aldosterone because this is also the order of the pathway. Since the kidney is trying to maintain the blood pressure at a normal range, any deviation from this normal range will cause a change in RAS. Things like a decrease in blood pressure, reduced delivery of sodium to the macula densa cells in the distal tubule, which is also a consequence of decreased blood pressure, or increased sympathetic tone will lead to an increase in the release of renin. The renin is released from the juxtaclomerular cells, which we'll talk about in some upcoming slides, but these cells are modified smooth muscle cells in the afferent arterioles in the kidney. Now all three of these changes will occur in a state of low blood pressure such as blood loss for example. And renin is an enzyme which converts angiotensinogen produced by the liver into angiotensin 1. And angiotensin 1 is then converted into angiotensin 2 by an enzyme in the lungs called ACE, angiotensin converting enzyme. And angiotensin converting enzyme also, in addition to activating angiotensin,
inhibits bradykinin, which is an important vasodilator. Now, angiotensin II has a number of effects. The first is that it stimulates general vasoconstriction by activating vascular smooth muscle cells, and this leads to an increase in blood pressure. It also stimulates the constriction of the efferent arterioles of the glomerulus, and this leads to an increase in the filtration fraction to preserve renal function in low volume states where there's decreased renal blood flow. Angiotensin II also stimulates the release of aldosterone from the adrenal gland, which stimulates the reabsorption of sodium and therefore water in the collecting tubules. Angiotensin II also stimulates the release of antidiuretic hormone from the posterior pituitary, which allows for water to be reabsorbed through the aquaporin channels in the collecting tubule. Finally, angiotensin II stimulates the reabsorption of sodium in the proximal tubule, which will bring water with it, and it stimulates the hypothalamus to give the person a sense of thirst and replenish their body fluids. In total, these six different mechanisms by which angiotensin II increases blood pressure directly or indirectly have a really important place in antihypertensive therapy. As you can see, when taking a drug like enalopril, which is an ACE inhibitor, it's so effective in reducing blood pressure because it's making all six of these pathways less effective. Now one more important hormone to know is atrial natriuretic peptide, ANP. Now this hormone is actually working against RAS. Stretching of the cardiac atria due to increased blood volume is going to cause the release of ANP, which then relaxes vascular smooth muscle cells. So it's going to inhibit this vasoconstriction and, and dilate those vascular smooth muscle cells. It also increases the GFR by dilating the afferent arterial, and this is done to allow the blood to continue to be filtered while reducing the blood pressure. ANP also decreases renin release, and by decreasing renin release will decrease the conversion of angiotensinogen to angiotensin. And one additional note is that it decreases sodium reabsorption in the proximal tubule which will also help to lower blood pressure. Now knowing the inhibitors for important pathways will be key for the exam. And RAS is a very important pathway, especially with the high prevalence of hypertension. So knowing the pathway as well as inhibitors of the pathway, such as ANP, will be important for your exam as well as your clinical practice. Let's briefly talk about the juxtaglomerular apparatus. This collection of cells serves as a sensor and feedback system to maintain blood pressure. Now the macula densa cells, which are part of this apparatus, detect the concentration of sodium in the filtrate in the distal tubule. So these are actually cells in the distal tubule. And the JG cells the juxtaglomerular cells sense the blood pressure in the afferent arterial. Now, reduced blood pressure is going to lead to reduced sodium delivery to the distal tubule. So, both the JG cells and the macula densa cells are ultimately detecting the same thing, which is the blood pressure of the body. So, it makes sense that the JG cells are going to release renin when the macula densa cells are activated or if the JG cells become directly activated by low blood pressure. Now the macula densa cells can directly stimulate the JG cells to release renin if they get low delivery of sodium to the distal tubule. Now the JG cells are 
modified smooth muscle cells in the afferent arterial. So in which layer of the arterial do you think they're found? They're going to be found in the tunica media with the other smooth muscle cells. All right, let's try a flash quiz. The sodium concentration along the length of the proximal tubule remains constant, which means it has net reabsorption, net secretion, or neither. There will be net reabsorption. Let's look back at our graph of relative concentrations along the proximal tubule. Notice that the TF to P ratio of sodium is very close to 1 and it's in the purple region, the reabsorption region. This means that the sodium concentration along the length of the proximal tubule remains constant. Remember, this is because water will move isoosmotically with sodium. Don't get confused by thinking that a TF to P ratio higher than 1 means secretion and a TF to P ratio lower than 1 means reabsorption. This is wrong. In order to be secreted, a substance must have a TF to P ratio that is higher than inulin. And if it's lower than inulin, we'll have reabsorption. So the key here is looking at it relative to inulin.